of uh, today's speaker and, and, and his work, and, and, and what he proposes to talk today. Uh, is well worth it. journey that the Indian Academy of Sciences has started uh, to promote dialogue between science, scientists, and society and everything in between. And, and, uh, and the Center for Contemporary Studies at the Indian Institute of Science. And I thank uh, CCS for providing the venue, making all the uh, background arrangements, even though of, uh, Professor Karakar and, and Vikas Abbas uh, were away during this week uh, on other, other engagements. Um, okay, so let me say a few words to just set the stage for today's talk. Um, um, you know, all school children uh, in, in India learn a famous poem by Tagore that uh, I begin to say, it, and I'm sure all of you recognize it starts with the words. Uh, <coughs> But it has, uh, uh, <coughs> that, that it comes to, it comes to that, that the first, first phrase of the ranking up. But it, it says, uh, where the mind is without fear. That's how it starts, where the mind is without fear, and the head is high. Uh, and knowledge is free. And it goes on to say a lot of other things. And then it, it ends with, uh, uh, in that, uh, fear, you know, heaven of freedom, my father is my country uh, awake. Yeah? And uh, so Tagore had some things in mind when he included this phrase where knowledge is free as part of this idea of, 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 of heaven of the heaven of freedom that he wanted the country to, uh, to awake to. Um, but you know, we live in a different era today where uh, we're supposed to live in knowledge society we're supposed to be involved in the production of knowledge and the modification of knowledge. So the questions perhaps uh, as compared to the time I wrote of this poem are very different and the answer, answers uh, are more complex than, than perhaps uh, when, when I wrote, uh, wrote, wrote this poem. Uh, but all of us would have some notion regardless of what position we hold uh, with respect to whether knowledge should be free and, and, and you know, what, do we do, what do we do with intellectual philosophy and all that stuff. We, we all probably have a notion that there is some body of knowledge and information which we consider to <coughs> be public knowledge. And, and, uh, and that, that public knowledge should perhaps be freely accessible, uh, certainly, and, and freely, and free. To, to everybody. Uh, and uh, from sort of looking at uh, some of the work that uh, Mahmoud has been uh, involved with, uh, it appears that even in that more restricted domain, uh, the situation is not so simple. Okay? So he has, in fact, been involved in making at least what is considered public information truly. Uh, freely available to the country. Uh, so he's uh, been uh, <coughs> founder and president of a, an, an NGO in California called uh, uh, Public Resource. And, and uh, <coughs> so he's going to today talk about um, a lot of work that he has been involved in, uh, such as uh, so making information from the U.S. Patent Office and the Securities. Uh, Exchange Commission uh, freely available, etc. I won't go through all of it. He will sort of mention uh, examples that illustrate things that he's going to tell us. Um, and, and like I said, um, some of this may well come as a surprise to you, but they are in fact not so freely available. Um, and, and in India, he has been involved uh, with 
uh, information from the uh, National Bureau of Standards, uh, Indian Standards, and again, I was personally surprised that uh, this, this is not readily and freely available information. Um, so he will have a lot of surprising things to tell us. But all of this is perhaps for this audience uh, somewhat esoteric in the sense that you know, we don't get to very think about standards and patents and so on, very patents. But, uh, but uh, <coughs> something that we can all very readily relate to is um, the um, access to information <coughs> of a scientific and technical uh, variety. We deal with it every day with the sort of downloading and reading papers, getting frustrated about not being able to download papers um, uh, because they're sold by the journal that, that, that publishes them. Uh, but uh, one sort of broad, confusing fact about this situation is the majority of research that produces this knowledge is one way or the other publicly how do we deal with this uh, fact and, and, and what expectations should we have about this information being in fact being available? Uh, so uh, I, I, I believe that uh, Carl will focus at least a far, good part of his talk on the latter questions. And, and uh, so uh, I welcome him uh, uh, to uh, this, this event of the Academy of Sciences. So he'll tell us about access to all knowledge. It's for the live streaming. Do you have a good signal? Yes. Good. <laughs> uh, I want to thank the Indian Academy of Sciences and the Center for Contemporary Studies, uh, Dr. Shastri, for that very nice uh, introduction. Uh, Mr. Makesh Chandra from the Indian Academy of Sciences and Professor Joshi um, and Dr. Day who originally invited me to come here. Um, I'm going to talk about access to knowledge. I, I'm going to talk about things like Sci-Hub, um, grand challenges and opportunities we have before us and some specific actions one can take to make knowledge available. Um, and how to get there, um, how we can learn from Gandhiji and Martin Luther King and others on, on how to change our world. But first, at the end of the first half of this talk, I want to explain where I'm coming from, the meandering path that, that led me to this. So I'm going to talk about some non-scientific uh, databases. Um, my background, I want to make very clear, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I went to law school for one year and dropped out. Um, I was uh, trained as an economist. I studied antitrust and regulation of industry. And I was just about ready to do my dissertation. I finished my orals for my doctorate and I dropped out of that program uh, because computers were starting to happen about 1982 or so. The mini computers were starting to get deployed. And I, I taught myself how to use computers. Um, became somewhat of an expert on databases and networking. I helped um, develop the Indiana University Computing Center. I went to the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in the United States and worked as part of a team that moved our money supply forecasting off of mainframes using COBOL and punch cards, or uh, probably not punch cards by the time I got there. Um, two sun workstations and ethernets and things of that sort. Um, at the time, by the way, our money supply forecasting was based on COBOL code. Uh, the head of our special study division did a study that compared our econometric model to Chase, one of the big banks, and to a random walk, throwing the dice, and it turned out the random walk was um, winning on a consistent basis. So that was how we were able to purchase sun workstations and install them. Um, I spent most of the 1980s working on computing and writing professional reference books. I wrote a three-volume series on network protocols. And as part of that, I had to consult a lot of standards. And computer science standards come from the International Standards Organization and the IEEE and groups like that, and they're very, very expensive. And as a freelance writer, I was spending thousands of dollars writing these things. 
uh, uh, writing the books, but, but to buy the raw materials I needed to explain. And one of the key standards at the time was the International Telecommunication Union Blue Book, stack of standards this high. And it described the standards for telephone networks, uh, for how voices, voice gets encoded, sound compression, what we know of as MPEG-3 today, signaling systems, uh, what we know today as voice over IP, but in those days it was very different. And I wrote a series of columns about how the Blue Book should be available, because we on the internet were basing the internet on the telephone network, and we needed those standards. And I got myself a meeting with the Secretary General of the ITU, uh, way up on the big tower they have in Geneva. And he was an interesting guy. He was willing to look at change. And I said, you know, we should put the ITU Blue Book on the internet. And he said, well, young man, I'd love to let you put the ITU uh, Blue Book on this internet of yours. He kept referring to this internet of yours. Uh, but we can't because we have a problem. We're using a very old typesetting program and we lost our source code. All we have is the object code left, the compiled version. And so we really can't give it to you. And I said, well, okay, how about if you give me the object code and if we can figure out like what's there, uh, we'll give it back your source code and wouldn't that be great? And he thought to himself, well, there's no risk in this small internet. And so we uh, took a copy of the blue book and a bunch of uh, mag tapes and uh, brought them back to Colorado where I was at the time and we did an octal dump of the object code and compared it to the books and said well that must be an E and that must be a paragraph mark and we turned it all into TROF was a, a typesetting language and we put it up on a FTP server and I got a call from the National Science Foundation saying Carl you're using half the international bandwidth on the internet right now because everybody was FTPing the blue book everybody who worked on the internet and about a week later, we got a fax from the Secretary General saying, well, we have decided to conclude the experiment. Please retrieve all copies of the Blue Book from the Internet. And that was a proverbial cat's out of the bag. I'm sorry, I really can't help you on that one anymore. Um, and that got me interested in big databases, um, in doing things. I, I spent quite a while working as part of a group of people in the Internet Engineering Task Force uh, that helped create the Internet standards. And those standards are totally open. Um, we didn't believe you take out patents on your request for comments. That was just not something you did. Uh, there was another set of protocols called Open Systems Interconnect, uh, which was developed by the big standards bodies. And they sold their standards for lots and lots and lots of money. And one of the reasons I believe TCP IP works is because the standards were available and the reason this big, huge effort for OSI failed is because it wasn't available. And we learned that when Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf came out with what's known as TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, turns out TCP didn't work. There was a fatal flaw in it in that if, if a packet didn't make it in, the retransmission of the packet uh, didn't work. It just wasn't working. And there was a random guy in Berkeley who came up with a 12-line patch, and all of a sudden the internet started to work, or at least TCP did. Um, and that taught me a lesson, which is uh, there's always somebody smarter than you out there. There's always some random person that will come up and do things. So my contributions to the internet protocol suite were, were fairly minor. Um, I, but I got to work with people like John Postel and Paul Makapetris, who invented the DNS. Um, and it was a real pleasure. I decided I wanted to get my hands dirty though because I was writing all professional reference books so I decided to start a radio station on the internet in 1993. Um, it's what you now know of as podcasting and live streaming and things of that sort. Uh, my flagship program was Geek of the Week. Uh, we did an interview every week with somebody like Tim Berners-Lee who had invented this newfangled thing called the World Wide Web. And, uh, but we also made it a real radio station. We joined the, uh, we had a, a booth in the National Press Club and so I was able to live stream the Dalai Lama and Al Gore and people like that. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I made it a nonprofit corporation. It was a little early to be doing a dot com and making lots and lots of money. On the other hand, I, I also thought it was a little too early to be making it commercial because the internet was a new medium and I thought we would need to change what we were doing and as a business you couldn't do that. And I actually got a call from Nick Negroponte who ran the Media Lab and he read about my radio station because it made the front page of the New York Times and he wanted a business plan from me 
And I called him back the next day and I said, I've decided to make it a nonprofit, Nick. And he was disgusted. He was like, because he saw that as a real business opportunity. Um, I think I was right, though. Uh, first of all, we were able to experiment a lot with radio, but more importantly, we were able to do other things. And I was approached by a member of Congress, a chairman of a committee, who said, you know, I got a note from these people saying the Securities and Exchange Commission Edgar database should be on the internet for free. Now, the Edgar database is the filings of all public corporations in the United States. So when you're doing an IPO, you file, you do an annual report, you do a quarter report. And at the time, those reports were like $30 each because the SEC had a system set up and they, they thought only a few rich fat cats on Wall Street needed this data. So they wholesaled the data for $300,000 and companies like Dow Jones and Disclosure bought it, right? They ran a T1 line into the SEC or into their vendor. They bought the data and they added value, made it better, and then they sold these things for $30 each. And I thought that was nuts. So I went back into the congressional staff and I said, nah, there's no reason you couldn't put this thing on the database. And a very brave person at the National Science Foundation gave me a grant. And so I got a grant from the American people to buy this data from the American government and give it back to the American people and give it away for free. And I ran it for two years. And then I put a sign up on our website that said, uh, this service will terminate in 60 days. I showed our user stats and we were getting tons of people. I posted our source code. I said, click here to send mail to Al Gore. He had an email address. Click here to send mail to Newt Gingrich, the Speaker of the House. He had an email address. Click here to send mail to the Chairman of the SEC. He didn't have an email address, so we set one up for him. We got 17,000 messages for him. We printed them out, brought them down to the SEC, and we got his attention. Um, and he finally called the Wall Street Journal and said, you know, we're going to make this database available. This is not a commodity to be sold. This makes our markets transparent and more efficient, which was my point in the whole first place anyway. I then got a call from the chief of staff the next day saying, well, you know, the chairman said uh, we're going to make this available, uh, but we really can't do it within your 60-day deadline. Can you extend it? And I said, no, we can't do that. But we worked out a deal. We loaned them computers. Uh, Eric Schmidt was at Sun in those days, and he had donated some computers to us. So we loaned them our, our computers. We gave them our source code. We went down and configured their T1 line because their router wasn't working properly. And they were up and running. And something miraculous happened at that point. The IT department hated what we were doing. They were saying, oh, you're going to introduce viruses in the Edgar database. And you know, this is destroying this big $300 million system they had put together. But then all of a sudden, they found themselves running the busiest website in the federal government. And they, they got all happy because you know, their bosses were buying them big fancy computers. And they were winning awards. And they, they just really embraced it. Um, we also, we had enough extra money in the NSF grant that I bought all the patents as well because that was a feed that was available from the patent office. Now the patent office was making $40 million a year selling DVDs and stuff like that and so they didn't cave in nearly as quickly as the SEC. It took 10 years to get that database actually online. Um, I actually put it online twice and then Google finally was able to work out a deal with the patent office and got the whole thing up and running. And that's always my goal, is to get them to, you know, to do that. It's not my job to be in charge of Edgar or, or the patent system or something of that sort. Um, did a variety of other databases. Um, I talked to the archivist of the United States and said, you know, you got all sorts of great videos in your archives. Are you going to put them online? And of course, they had a five-year plan, a uh, ten-year plan to uh, eventually get them online. But I said, you know, can I send volunteers in, maybe with DVD duplicators? And he said, oh, yeah, that would be great. And so we sent in volunteers, and they copied 6,000 videos, and we threw them on YouTube, and we've had 75 million viewers so far. Um, we were able to get a bunch of congressional video, 14,000 hours of video. Um, what happened there is the, um, the speaker, uh, speaker Boehner asked us to help one committee get online, the Committee on House Oversight. And so we helped them you know, do live streaming and closed captioning and all that. Uh, but the back file was something that we also were able to do for the committee. So I went to House Broadcast Studio and said, you know, can I get, get the video? And they said, well, we're really busy. We're really busy. I said, well, maybe I can help. It's in a professional format. You probably couldn't handle it. And I said, well, you know, 
let me look at it. And so they handed me a Blu-ray drive and a Blu-ray disc, and I looked, and it was an MPEG-2 transport stream, and I said, yeah, we, we can handle this. And so they sent me a binder by FedEx, and it had 50 Blu-ray DVDs in it. And I opened it up, and I looked at the labels, and it wasn't just my committee, House Oversight, it was a whole bunch of committees. And so I went and I bought six DVD readers, and I copied it as quickly as I could, and I FedExed it back, back to them, and I called them up and I said, do you have any more? I said, oh yeah, we got lots. And so all summer they kept sending me these binders, and I'd copy them and send them back, and then I went to Washington and I said, do you have anything else? And they, oh, we have a bunch of disk drives. And so I copied those, and I found myself in the speaker's office talking to his general counsel, saying, well, it appears that you sent me the entire Congress by mistake, but that won't be a problem, will it? because in the US, of course, there's no copyright on these things, at which point they cut off my experiment. Um, I had about half the archive from 2002 to 2011. It's, it's like 6,000 hearings, 14,000 hours of video, and it's all up on the Internet Archive. Um, about 2008, I started a nonprofit called Public Resource, and I started focusing on the law. And at the time, the U.S. Court of Appeals, uh, a few of them were, were putting their contemporary opinions online, their new ones. But again, the back file wasn't there. And as you know, to do science, you need to know what people did before you. To do the law, you need to know what people have done. And so I was able to work with a professor named Larry Lessig, and we bought the back file from one of the vendors, spent $600,000, and got the U.S. Court of Appeals online. Um, did some substantial work with the... Um, district court dockets with a young friend of mine named Aaron Schwartz. Um, that was not nearly as successful, uh, but we were able to do a comprehensive analysis of the uh, U.S. courts and found that they had systematic privacy issues. And so that's kind of what I did in the United States, was looked for databases, and I had some rules. I looked for big data that you could purchase that didn't have copyright. Right? Then it's just a matter of money, right? get $300,000, you can put the SEC online. I learned how to do web crawling. If the data was there but on a really bad system, sometimes you could pull it out and make it a lot more effective. Uh, sometimes you have to buy paper and scan it. Now, one of the things I always did is whenever I put a database online, I always made sure anybody else could download the whole thing. Uh, making bulk data available is very important. And again, it's that rule. There's always somebody smarter than you out there. So that's very important. And if you look at a lot of government portals in which they say, we're putting you know, these works online, they don't have bulk download. You have to like, go through all sorts of shenanigans in order to get the data. One of my other rules is you always try to push it back into the government. And that means that sometimes you have to be aggressive, but sometimes you have to be helpful. When the SEC started doing the right thing, people wanted to really pound them and say, well, they should have done it earlier. And I was like, no, that's wrong. Congratulate them. <coughs> say they're doing a wonderful thing. When, when they actually change their mind, that's really important. So we're, we're getting towards Sci-Hub, but we got a couple more stops on this path. So one of the, I was doing the law in 2008, and I noticed there were a set of laws that were totally not available and those were technical public safety codes, building codes, electrical codes, fire codes, standards for the safety in factories, for personal protective equipment, for eyeglasses, for ladders, uh, the safety of textile machines, safety of hazardous material transport, right? If you're gonna transport uranium, here are some technical standards. Um, standards for testing for lead in water, very important laws, and in the United States, these are often developed by nonprofits, and then they're incorporated into law. Now, they're binding law. They're no different than any other law, but they weren't available, and they were very expensive, very expensive. And so I, I read very carefully the case law, and in the United States, the law has no copyright. Um, I convinced myself that there was a Fifth Circuit decision of the U.S. Court of Appeals and in which a young man had put the Texas Building Code online, and he had won his appeal. They said, no, no, it's the law. Even though it was originally a model code, it is now the law. And so I started posting all the technical standards in the United States that were the law. And that was about in 2007, 2008. And about 2013, the standards bodies decided they had enough 
and they sued me. Uh, six plaintiffs sued me, and it has gone up through the court system. We just uh, finished our oral argument in front of the U.S. Court of Appeals. Litigation is incredibly expensive in the United States. My law firms all work for me pro bono. They don't charge. But I asked for a bill, because uh, they track their time. In 2015, my pro bono legal bill was $2.8 million. Uh, the next year, it was $1.8 million. Um, so defending these kinds of onslaughts, I mean, the other side, it was six plaintiffs, four law firms, two different suits that got consolidated, and it's just gone on and on. We did the same thing in Europe. We ended up in court in Germany over the, uh, you're going to love this, the European Union mandated safety standard for baby pacifiers, you know, the things, uh, the soothers that they put in their mouth. And the standard had some things that ordinary people might want to know. So for example, if there's little pellets in the baby pacifier, it should be on the outside, not on the inside part, because otherwise the baby chews through it and they swallow them. The, the uh, part that goes on your mouth needs to be a certain diameter so the baby doesn't swallow it. So the <coughs> argument often is that these technical standards are of no use to consumers and individuals. And I totally disagree with that. I think building codes are something that um, if you're looking at, at requirements for egress, right, if there's a fire, are there proper exits or not, that's something any school principal ought to be able to look at. Any city official ought to be able to look at that. And you know what? It costs an awful lot of money to buy these things, and cities have to ration their use. In India, I was looking at Indian standards, because again, I was doing this all over the world. And my friend Anish Chopra was chief technology officer of the United States. He said, well, you've got to go meet my friend Sam Petroda. Sam Petroda was a member of the cabinet for Manmohan Singh. And I called him up and said, Petroda, gee, may I come see you? And I went and saw him, and I brought copies of the Indian standards. And I said, you know, these should be available. And he goes, why aren't they? I said, well, the Bureau of Indian Standards sells them. Pretty high price, 14,000 rupees for the National Building Code of India. That's a lot of money for a book. And you know, every engineering student in India has to, has to use these materials. So it, it has tremendous educational use. And so I explained the situation to Sam. And I said, I'm thinking of posting these. And he goes, go, go for it. That's good. And I said, well, you know, the Bureau of Indian Standards is going to be rather annoyed. And he goes, I don't care. And so I took all 19,000 standards and I put them online. Uh, spent $5,000 to buy the subscription to get all of them. And about a year and a half later, I got a, uh, a letter from the Bureau of Indian Standards saying it's time to renew your contract. Would you like to renew it? And so I sent them a purchase order saying, yes, I'd like to renew, and a letter that said, by the way, here's all your standards. They're online, and we've taken a 1,000 of them and we've retyped them into HTML. We've redrawn the diagrams into SVG so you can make them bigger and smaller and cut and paste them. We've coded the formulas into MathML. Uh, we have made them accessible so, so that if you are visually impaired, you can hear these standards. And they got very upset. They cut me off. No more standards for you. Um, they said I was violating copyright. Uh, they threatened to sue. They didn't actually sue. And so we did what you do in this situation. We petitioned the ministry. And we prepared a very nice petition, notarized affidavits from Vince Cerf, from Sam Petroda, from a whole slew of distinguished professors of water engineering and transport in India, um, explained why these things were mandatory. Uh, ministry rejected us out of hand, and so we filed a public interest litigation suit in the High Court of Delhi. Um, I am joined as a petitioner by Srinivas Kodali, a talented uh, transport engineer who also has been doing amazing work on Aadhaar. Um, a lot of the security bugs in Aadhaar and things like that, um, he, he's been deeply involved in finding those. And uh, Sushant Sinha, who runs uh, the amazing Indian Kanoon, which comes right here out of Bangalore. It's all the court cases of India. Uh, we are represented by Nashith Desai, one of the leading law firms um, in India. And our senior advocate is Salman Khurshid. Um, so uh, on Wednesday, we were in fact in front of the High Court of Delhi for our oral argument. We got about five minutes in and they ran out of time. Um, so we're going to be back on October 9th and we have hopes. Uh, our position is that these are the law. 
that these standards are the law, and in India the law it is fair use to use it, that the standards are not simply some voluntary thing. Uh, Ninety of them are compulsory. Uh, if you sell steel in India, it must be certified by the Bureau of Indian Standards. And by the way, the bulk of their revenue is certification revenue. Less than 2% of their revenue is standard sales. They don't need this money. Many of the standards are used in, in regulations by the union government and the state. So the Ministry of Textiles uses the textile standards and the Ministry of Steel. Um, the standards are developed in a process supervised by two ministers, joined by four state ministers, four members of parliament. It's an elaborate process that begins with committees that have a lot of government employees and professors, all volunteering their time. Uh, there is a public comment period. Uh, they are then approved. They are then noticed in the official gazette, and they become official Indian standards. That's about as law-like as you can imagine, right? They're not acts of parliament. They're not regulations of the ministries. They are nevertheless the law. So we're suing the Indian government. I was sued uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, based on that and a variety of incidents that happened when we were trying to put court documents online, I did a deep dive into the, the issue of questioning authority. How do you do that? Right? How do you change a system? And that, of course, brought me to Gandhiji, to Martin Luther King. I did a deep dive into Indian law because I thought, as an American, if I was going to the Indian government saying, you are doing it wrong, these should be available. I should take some time to learn a little bit about the system. And so I bought the three volume constitutional law series that Sirvai had, um, a whole bunch of other things, and I did a lot of reading and a deep dive into Indian history because I really wanted to understand a lot more about the system of government. That led me to focus even more on India, uh, particularly with my friend Sam Petroda inviting me to travel with him, which is a real trip. Uh, it is amazing watching him walk through India. He'll, you know, there'll be a thousand people in the audience. We go to board a plane to Bangalore and uh, we're on the jetway and five different people came up to get selfies with him while we're trying to board the plane. Um, it was quite the experience. Um, so I've told you about the standards collection, the technical knowledge of India. Um, there's a system called the Digital Library of India that was put together that had about 550,000 books that were scanned over a 10-year period. And the scans weren't the greatest, uh, but it's an important collection. And I set a number of web crawlers going, and it took me about six months, and I was able to get 463,000 of those books, and I put them on the Internet Archive. The government took their server down, so I am now running the only copy of the Digital Library of India. Presumably, they'll put it back up again. They had some copyright issues. They were a little sloppy on copyright. Um, but I looked at it, and we took about 60,000 of the books off. So, you know, British medical journals, for example, we, we just removed those. But the vast majority of this collection is really amazing. It's, you know, 30,000 books in Sanskrit. It's 19,000 books in... In, um, in Gujarati, it's 20,000 books in Telugu, and uh, I am very pleased the volunteers have been going into the metadata for the Telugu, and they have been retyping the titles into the Telugu script rather than the romanized version. Same thing with the creators. So we're beginning to get crowdsourcing. And uh, we have, uh, I, I'm sorry, our, our, our uh, Arjuna is here, and uh, he's the guy that's been leading that effort. So uh, we're beginning to get people making this digital library of India better. Um, I've been crawling DSpace. So we have 23,000 books from the West Bengal Public Library we're about to add. I added a whole bunch of Sanskrit books that were at the archaeological survey. Uh, there's 2,000 videos. Uh, that we found that we're putting online. And I've renamed it the Public Library of India because I didn't want anybody to think that I was pretending that I was the Indian government. Um, so we've taken great pains to, to make sure we're okay there. Um, the third collection, uh, working with Sushant Sinha and some volunteers, we are mirroring all the official gazettes of India at the union level but also the states. And you know, some states don't even have them online. But the ones that are online, we're systematically grabbing, we're putting them on the Internet Archive, we're running them through OCR. And so for the union government, the official gazette, uh, you can now search inside them, right? Because we've now got OCR and some of them are born digital, so you can do keyword searches. 
then find out which volumes of the Gazette um, you know, talked about vice chancellor appointments, for example, or regulations from a particular ministry. Um, that project is just starting, and we're going to be doing it for the next couple of years. Um, have some very sophisticated crawling code uh, that is open source. It's, gonna, it's on GitHub already. Uh, we haven't publicized it yet. So that's three collections, and then I'm going to tell you about one more, and then we're going to get to scientific knowledge. Um, I went to see Sam Petrota one day and he handed me a USB drive and I said, what's on there? He goes, the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, all 100 volumes. <laughs> and I looked at it and said, well, can I put it online? He goes, yes, of course. And I said, well, where'd you get it? Well, Sabarmati Ashram. Well, aren't they putting it online? Yeah, they're working on that. I said, well, won't they be annoyed <laughs> if I do it? Uh, and it turns out uh, I have made many visits now to the Sabramati Ashram. Um, they were a, a little worried at first about what I was doing because it wasn't them doing it. Uh, but they seem to feel that this is a good thing. But since I had the collected works of Gandhiji online, I went and found a lot of the selected works of Nehru were on a government server, but they were missing about 10 volumes. So I grabbed the ones that they had, I bought the other volumes, and I put those online. So we now have the most complete collection of the selected works of Nehru. We have the uh, complete works of Ambedkar. Uh, we have 129 audio files of Gandhiji speaking at prayer meetings during the last year of his life, as well as the English translations from the, selected, from the collected works. So you can listen to Gandhiji speak, you can see what was in the collected works with the footnotes, and then you can click into the collected works and you can see what letters he wrote that day, who he saw the previous day, and you can really just walk through that year of his life. It's really quite, quite incredible. The other thing we've recently been adding to that collection is the, um, I've been going to the publications division of the Ministry of Information and they publish amazing collection of books. They're just, you know, thousands of books um, since the 1960s and earlier. And I've been buying every book I can find. On the used market, I go to the government bookstore, and we've got you know, the 50 volume builders of modern India. There's books about hairstyles of the forest people. There's books about the, the lamps of India. Uh, there's books about how saris are, are done. I, I've been getting the archaeological survey guides to the various monuments, and that's all online. Um, if, if you want, uh, I have a book that I wrote with Sam called Code Swaraj. Um, it's at public.resource.org slash swaraj, all lowercase. And at the back of the book is a table of links. And so it's got links to all these different resources. So if you want to go look at them, you can. So I've been focusing on government and works of government. And I want to talk about scientific knowledge. And I'm going to go back to the US. Um, we have a special provision in US law called Works of the U.S. Government. And it says that anything done by federal employees or officers in the course of their official duties has no copyright. It's a special aspect of U.S. law. In India, the government can have copyright. There are certain fair use exemptions. But in the U.S., federal works have no copyright. And the reason that was put in is the, the, um, the chairman of the printing um, committee of the U.S. Senate had put together the works of the, of, of the presidential papers. And the government printing office had published them, but he wanted to do his own private version of those. And he got the government printing office to give him the plates. This is in 1895. And he was going to assert copyright. And his fellow senators were so pissed off by that, they inserted this works of the US government uh, provision in the 1895 Printing Act. And it has survived. So I had a question, which is I knew that a lot of federal employees authored journal articles. And I was curious how many were there. And so we did a systematic survey of the scholarly literature. Uh, searched three commercial services. I also made a copy of Sci-Hub and used that. We found 1.2 million journal articles by federal employees. Now, was it in the course of their official duties? Because if you go home and write a paper, you can have copyright. And so we pulled 10,000 of them out. We pulled statistically valid samples by publisher and by agency, and then looked at those and looked at the, the, the note at the bottom where it says, oh, you know, here is my name. I currently work for the Federal Communications Commission. I wrote this paper when I was a student. OK, not a work of the government. 
I'm chairman of the Federal Trade Commission. I would like to thank my attorney advisors. I am briefing the antitrust section of the American Bar Association, our enforcement and priorities for the upcoming year. Work of the U.S. government, absolutely clearly. The other thing we looked at, and, and so the problem was, in U.S. law, you're supposed to stamp any journal article that is a work of the U.S. government. So you can have copyright in your journal, but if you have a paper by President Obama under Section 403 of the Copyright Act, you're supposed to say this paper doesn't have copyright. It's a work of the U.S. government. And so we looked for that indication, and almost nobody put that there. The vast majority of the publishers simply said, copyright, all rights reserved. Many of these papers we found, uh, we tried looking for them from the University of North Carolina, a major state institution. A lot of these we couldn't even access. They weren't available to the UNC students under the, the very expensive uh, subscription services they had. Um, works of government is an example of overreaching by the publishers. Of, of saying something is theirs that is not. And there's many other examples. In the US, if you have a periodical before 1963, you had to renew your copyright. Um, and a University of Pennsylvania researcher went through and looked at renewals and found that almost no renewals were done. In other words, many of the journals prior to 1963 published in the United States don't have valid copyright. Despite that, if you go to these fancy subscription services, again, copyright rights reserved. Give you another example. There was a young student that was looking at psychological studies, many of them published by the American Psychological Association, and she was doing a meta-analysis. So she wanted to download 250 papers, and she got to about 50, and her access was cut off. The book, she went to her librarian and said, my access was cut off. And on the on, on system where it said it's cut off, it says, if, if you are doing bulk analysis of the data, you may contact us for a license. And so she contacted the American Psychological Association. They sent her this big, long contract. Um, my point here is that if you're trying to do big data, on the scholarly corpus, you just can't do it. Publishers don't allow you to do that. So copyright is a limited right. For a limited purpose, the purpose of copyright is the advancement of knowledge. It's not the garnering of revenue in my pocket. That's your incentive to advance knowledge. And there are many exceptions. Um, if you are blind, copyright does not apply. There is an international treaty that says the blind get access to literature. Um, copyright is for a limited time. It's not supposed to be forever. There are teaching exemptions saying if it's in the course of instruction. And that brings me back to India. There was a case, the Delhi University copy shop case. So there is a copy shop at Delhi University where you can go in and buy course packs. And what happens is a professor will go in and say, these are the articles in my class. And the copy shop would go to the library and they'd copy one copy to the copy shop and they'd, they'd prepare the course packs and they'd sell them to the students for a modest profit. They were raided by armed police and the head of the copy shop was taken away and they were sued by Oxford and Cambridge and Francis Taylor for massive copyright violation. And this case was, I mean, th this was no, excuse me, we think we may have a problem here. Um, it was full-fledged litigation. And it went to the High Court of Delhi and several people intervened on behalf of the students and the teachers and they pointed out to the justice and law that under Indian law, under the Copyright Act, if a work is being provided by a teacher or student in the course of instruction, copyright does not apply. And Justice and Law looked at it and said, oh, you're right. There's no case. You're allowed to sell these, these copy packs. So there is a teaching exemption. And that's just not just Indian law. This is in the Berne Convention, right? The International Treaty says that countries may have a teaching exemption. It is also deeply, deeply embedded in the Indian Constitution. The right to education, the right to life is based on the right to educate yourself. The right to practice the profession of your choice is based on the ability to educate yourself. Every student up to 14 has a right 
to an education under the Indian Constitution. Parents are required to provide that education. Um, and so this is deeply embedded. It's also deeply embedded in Indian history. If you look at Taxila and Nalanda, if you look at the Buddhist councils, the idea that we get together and talk about things and share knowledge. If you look at the Bengal Renaissance, the idea that knowledge is something that we should impart is really quite, quite fundamental. And in fact, that Tagore poem that was quoted was part of our petition to the ministry. Um, which they obviously did not view with great respect, but um, they did, didn't like our petition. They just didn't buy the idea that standards must be available. So I mentioned that I had made a copy of SciHub um, for my purpose of examining it for works of the U.S. government, and that is a transformational purpose in the United States, a terabyte district arrays of all your data. Um, it contains 1,199,000 journal articles, 0.1%. There's about 93 million articles in total if you look at Crossref. I packed those up in a suitcase and I brought them with me on the airplane and I locked them up in India. And I went on the wire and I did an op-ed, uh, Who May Swim in the Ocean of Knowledge? And I made one point very, very clear. I have no intention of putting up a pirate site. Right? I'm not going to mirror Sci-Hub and just put it up. If you want to do that, you got BitTorrent, do it yourself. It's not what I do. Okay? What I do, and what I'm trying to do with Sci-Hub, is understand if under Indian law there is a way we can make these articles available to the 20 million students of India, rather than forcing them to go to a pirate site, because we know that India is the second largest downloader of Sci-Hub, China's the biggest, but you know in the top 10, the US and the UK are right up there in the top 10 because US students don't have access to the scholarly literature don't have access to a single article. Sometimes if you're a researcher and you need a, an article that isn't available in your subscription, publishers will charge you $5,000 for that single article. And you know, you gotta go to whoever gave you the grant and get them to approve that, and sometimes you have no choice. You say it's critical to my research to have that. I think it is time for the Indian universities to stand up for the students, and so I am, uh, on this trip, and I'm making three more trips to India this year, I am knocking on every door I can, uh, going to visit vice chancellors, going to visit professors, giving lectures at various institutes. I'll be at Jawaharlal Nehru University um, next week at the Institute of Information Hub maybe some other source of the data, but it seems to me that the scholarly literature is in fact legal under Indian law and should be available to the students, be available for the individual articles assigned, but available for the big data research that you cannot do unless you have the corpus there. And I don't know if we'll win on that one. And like I said, it's locked away right now. Um, it's very secure. I have, I, I'm going to be very careful about this. Um, we want to do this under Indian law. We want them to say it's okay. And we'd like to avoid litigation because you don't want to do that. What you really want to do is simply do, do the right thing and everybody says, okay, fine, it's the right thing. And so it may take a while to figure out how to do this, but I am embarking along that road. Now the question is, how do you make changes like this? And like I said, I did a deep reading, and, and if you're looking at questioning authority and changing how our government works, you always end up with Gandhiji. Uh, he taught us how to question authority and how to strive for a better world. He said we must all do public work. He taught us to struggle, and that, that teaching inspired Mandela, it inspired Martin Luther King. It was King that said that struggle is essential. He said that change does not come rolling in on the wheels of inevitability, it only comes with continuous struggle. What Gandhi did is more than just liberate India, what he did was decolonize the entire world. It was an example. It, it had huge effects in Africa, in all the colonies of the world. And today, knowledge has been colonized. Knowledge is in the hands of a few rich corporations, ironically enough, many of them in the United Kingdom. Um, there's a number of very rich societies that have been very aggressive. To me, 
Scientists are the new indigo farmers, right? You are preparing these raw materials. Journals are the railways. You're shipping them to England, and then they're shipping back these fancy finished goods and saying you may only buy them from us. Sci-Hub is, to me, a salt factory on the edge of the ocean of knowledge. It's an unlicensed salt factory. They are making salt, making it available for people, and they are getting persecuted for doing that. And so I believe that analogy actually holds to the modern world, and I am not trying to compare journals to the liberation of India, but I believe that analogy is a valid one. You may ask why this matters so much. We have some dire problems in our world today. We have climate change and climate change deniers, people in, particularly in governments, uh, my own president, who just don't believe it's real. We have great poverty, but growing inequality. We have disease and thousand dollar pills that can cure those diseases. We have a surplus of food in India and 200 million people starving. We have violence and intolerance. And you may ask, why do you care about access to knowledge? I, I, the reason for that is I think if you want to solve these big and important problems, we have to understand that democracy is based on an informed citizenry. We own our governments. Now, access to knowledge, I believe, is the great promise of our times. And if government isn't dealing with climate change, we need to educate ourselves and force our government to deal with climate change. If they are not dealing with thousand dollar pills for diseases that are rampant among the poor, we need to force our government to do the right thing. To paraphrase Gandhi, Gandhi, I think you can be the democracy you wish to see. Uh, we have to be involved citizens and, and that's how we change these kinds of things. Um, like I said, if there is a revolution in access to knowledge, I have become convinced that it's going to have to start in India for a whole variety of reasons. Largest democracy in the world, a long tradition of learning, a pressing need to educate. Um, decolonizing information, I believe, is an example that, that, that can be set for the world, and I think that will resonate in India. Revolutions such as this don't happen unless we act. And I think it's important that we understand that it's something that we must all do together. We all have to walk up that road to be, together. Um, and that's not going to be an easy walk. We've got to make that crooked path straight we got to walk up that road to that shining city on the hill where, where, where learning is available to everybody freely. Uh, there's a quote from the prophet Amos that Martin Luther King um, used to use frequently. And I want to paraphrase that. And that's that we must act and we must struggle so that knowledge flows like the waters until wisdom pours forth like a mighty stream. And that's something that Martin Luther King, I think, would have liked very much if he had been alive today. So thank you very much. I'd be very happy to entertain questions. So thank you very much. That was very stimulating and inspiring. Um, and and um, I'm sure there are lots of questions. So I will sort of, Carl will take them. Surely there must be at least one. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll start. Okay. And, um, so, um, the, you know, every argument of this magnitude has the other side, right? And, and uh, so, um, I, I, I mean, I, I want you to elaborate on some of the things you said, uh, because I, I think you were very careful in, in sort of articulating a boundary of, of this activism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is sort of a domain where, in fact, uh, uh, knowledge and information of either the scientific kind, actually with the scientific kind, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm not very clear uh, where the boundary will be, but in, in other domains one can in, imagine that there are legitimate boundaries within which uh, everything will not be freely available. 
Um, but in the scientific domain, the confusion that I, I would like to raise and, and, and would like you to say a little bit more is, as I said in my introduction, uh, even if you know the U.S. government federal labs is a very clear-cut example. You know, they, they, in fact, if you know these days when you submit articles online, there is a separate category of copyright, um, which is federal uh, employees. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I don't know what they do with it. But, uh, but if I'm sitting in a university, either in the US or in India, my work is still supported by the US government, the Indian government. And, and, and in that sense, what is produced should go back to a knowledge commons, right? uh, unless the governments which are supporting this have plans for commercializing and commodifying uh, what is produced, but they, they usually don't. They, mm -hmm. in, in terms of the funding uh, uh, strategies that governments have, they want knowledge to be generated and distributed. Mm -hmm. So they're not the ones who are sort of holding up a free distribution of knowledge, but they're the ones who are funding it. Mm -hmm. So how do you actually internationally handle this? Well, look, so, so the question is, it, you know, must, most or much research is publicly funded. Um, going forward, it is very clear that open access publishing is the wave of the future. Even the big fancy publishers are attempting to do these things like gold. You know, so if you pay them $5,000, they'll make it available. Although what happens is often they don't really make it available. They make it available on their site, but it's a DRM to PDF file, and there's terms of use and things like that. But if you look at physics, for example, it has moved very, very aggressively into a, a true open access uh, publishing. And I believe that's one part of the puzzle, is that we must continue to push very, very hard to do that. Uh, it's very important that universities reward their professors not for having published in, you know, the paywalled, you know, like doctors uh, get a lot of benefit from being in the American Medical Association journals, which are not open access. Um, maybe we should have different metrics for rewarding science. I, I think professions need to come together. Physics has been very good. Chemistry, not so good. Um, you know, and so I, I think it's important that the different scientific fields move forward. The back file, uh, you can't do scientific research without knowing what came before you. And we need to do something about that. Now look, I'm a firm believer that anybody deserves a fair return on their investment. That's just fine. But if you look at Reed Elsevier, for example, billion dollars a year in profits. Um, on scientific publishing, their gross margin is 39%, which is bigger than Google's gross margin. And Google's intensely profitable, um, but I think there has been some real overreach. And we're beginning to see some backlash. Um, if you look at Sweden, for example, they just stopped publishing to, uh, stop subscribing to Reed Elsevier. Uh, some of the German universities have done the same thing. Harvard is actually cutting back on their journals because they can't afford them anymore. And so I think the librarians need to push very hard on, on these licensing deals. I think we need to push very, very hard on things like course packs and things that are, um, so effort government of knowledge, and I don't think you can lock science up. And I don't care if they really want lots and lots of money out of that. It's, it's, it's immoral. I'm sorry. Um, and they've made a lot of money already on this corpus. And I think at some point it's got to stop. And we need to change how this happens. And it's going to require a mass revolution. It's not going to be a couple activists saying this needs to be done. It's got to be the scientists of the world standing up. In fact, in, in those days that you described of the internet era, that this was sort of an opening into a world where, in fact, everything was going to be available freely. But, but the internet obviously has taken a different turn in the intervening decades. Yeah, but, well, but, uh, I don't know about that. Yeah, it, it, there are 
groups that have used the internet as a uh, place for commercial exploitation and making lots of money. On the other hand, there's places like the Internet Archive that has scanned five million books. The guy who runs it made a whole bunch of money selling his companies to AOL and Obama has invested his riches in this NGO that has built the world's largest digital library. Access to knowledge is the great promise of our time. Every generation has something they can do to, to give to humanity, and that, that is our, our promise. Yeah, so the question is, what about librarians? So in the US, uh, when I put the law online, I spent a tremendous amount of time with law librarians. And in fact, they, they, they submitted friend of the court briefs on, on our efforts. Um, I have a, uh, a very prominent librarian on my board of directors. Uh, have spent a tremendous amount of time. I, you know, I love working with librarians. The American Library Association, again, supported a, a, a friend of the court brief. My work in India is just starting. I am shifting my focus pretty much 100% to India now. Um, I have three more trips scheduled for this year. Uh, I am funded under a grant for three years worth of work. And librarians are very high on the list of people I want to reach out to. And I think it's important. Uh, librarians all over the world are faced with this issue of the subscriptions. And, and it's kind of you know, a rock and a hard place. You have to make the literature available to your people. And that means these contracts. Um, and there is a growing movement of librarians all over the world that are pushing back very hard. One of the big issues with these big publishers is they prohibit you from telling others how much you spend for the subscriptions. And so librarians cannot compare among themselves. You know, one university will get a special deal and another one won't. Uh, in Canada, the librarians got together and they pooled all their information despite contracts that told them that they weren't allowed to do that. Right? They had non-disclosure agreements. They said, the hell with that. Um, and they published it. And they're able to start looking at metrics and saying, how much are we, we spending per, per student? And they noticed it varied wild, wildly. Um, it was very arbitrary. Um, I don't think you can do this in universities without the librarians. I, I think it's pretty simple. I just had a quick comment to add to what you just said. Uh, on a very small scale, no doubt, but Spicer Pune recently fairly successfully renegotiated very aggressively with some of these big publishers for their library deal. And they were so successful <coughs> that now, at least as a first step, all the ICERs librarians have gotten together and they are now planning to renegotiate as a block the five or seven ICERs with all the major publishers. So I, I, I guess the first one or two steps are, are happening also. And that is very helpful for, for making it a little bit better. But I think if we're going to have that true revolution, it's going to take a much broader thing. It's going to take the librarians and the scientists and the vice chancellors and a whole bunch of lawyers. So I think uh, how, how, what do you suggest on that? 
Well, American Chemical Society has been particularly aggressive um, in suing ResearchGate and, and Sci-Hub and folks like that. Um, look, I, I, I don't know the answer to negotiate. I, the answer is simple. The, the, the chemistry students and professors of the world need to stand up and say enough is enough. Um, same problem in, in my field. Uh, IEEE and the ACM are, are just totally against open access. They have a couple things that are available, so the Ethernet spec is finally available from the IEEE. Um, and that's because they got some corporation to sponsor it. Um, I, I think we need to stand up, particularly on these scholarly societies that, that have a, a higher purpose than simply making money. Um, and I, I don't think they will do the right thing unless we push them. I, I just don't see any way around it. So I, I like a lot of the publishers are taking small steps towards open access, but they're doing it in a way that's kind of, it's, it's the least they can get away with. It's like standards in the U.S. The building codes are now available on the Internet, partly in response to my own work, but they put it on the very worst website they possibly can. So if you're blind, you get nothing. Extensive terms of use. Uh, you can't print, you can't search, you can't save. There's no, no links. Um, and we're getting the same thing in scholarly publishing. They're doing open access, but they're, they're, they're just doing just what, you know, it's like a lawyer designed the open access program rather than a chemist. Uh, so, I mean, we, we have to, it has to be more than just a few activists going after it. It really has to be a mass uprising within the professions. That's going to be the only way, particularly in science, it's the only way to fix it. And, and when a couple professions lead the way, it's going to make it a lot easier for the others. So the physicists have done yeoman's work, right? And they also helped get the World Wide Web up and running. Because remember, Tim Berners-Lee was at CERN when he did it. It was to help physicists do things, and I, I'm particularly proud of that because my father uh, ran the main ring at Fermi Lab and com comes out of the physics world, so. Uh, but, but some professions are, are not doing enough. Also started the archive. Mm -hmm. The archive was also started by the physics community. Yes, no, absolutely, so absolutely, yeah. But, but the, there is a, so, so, anybody else has so my, my answer is I don't have all the answers, right? It, it's, I, I, I look for specific things I can do that are strategic, as, as you can see from, from the work that I've talked about. But I think everybody needs to be doing the same thing. And maybe the only thing you can do is write a letter to your society or run for the board of directors or start a student chapter that passes a resolution that says we believe this is wrong, right? Um, but, but everybody's got to look for something. Gandhi G said everybody needs to do public work. Everybody needs to do bread labor, right? Uh, every day you need to like do something. And this is something that if you're a scientist, bread labor might be writing letters to, to, to the American Chemical Society or starting petitions or whatever. So I'll let you ask the question, but uh, can I just make problem a problem we are facing right now is uh, in addition to, like suppose we send a, a paper to the Chemical So the, the question is, you do the open access and it's got a low impact factor and you submit it there and they come back to you and say, well, you know, if you do it over here on the other side of the paywall, your career will advance more because you're going to be in a more prestigious journal. Uh, that's pretty simple. We just have to stop um, uh, having those metrics be based on, on those kinds of situations, right? They, that, that is up to the universities and the students and the scholars. We just need to stop judging ourselves that way um, because we're just playing into the hands of, 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 of a bait and switch, which is, I, I, I think it's wrong. Um, and I understand that, you know, it's like my career is important. I need to like really get the highest impact I can. Um, and again, that's why we need to stand up as professions and, and, and begin saying, no, we're not gonna do that anymore. Um, we are going to come up with alternative metrics, and there's tremendous work being done in alternative metrics, right? Different ways of measuring impact, um, and we need to begin using those. Um, if you are tenured faculty, you need to, you know, figure out ways of, of coming up with different ways of deciding whether somebody gets tenure. Um, look, look at their works. Actually read their papers instead of just looking at the impact factor. I know that's a radical notion, but... Um, <laughs> Okay. No, but uh, I think uh, just as a comment to your last remark about Gandhiji, uh, see, whatever uh, sort of individual acts of activism he practiced were sort of 
guided by a worldview that is well formed uh, yep. uh, ahead of time, so to speak. Okay, though that's not entirely true. He kept revising his viewpoint. So here, I think one of the issues uh, that probably merits uh, a lot of attention is: Do we have really an agreed upon right view of of Lishay? how you evaluate all of this. And, and this actually will require, like you said in the beginning, a very major uh, act of introspection by the community. Well, so there, there's so two, two aspects to that. Okay, mm -hmm. One is that you need to begin the process of petitioning. It was Gokhale that said, we, we petition in order to educate ourselves and to educate our rulers, right? Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, before you commit satyagraha, you must really think about it. Before Gandhi walked to the sea, he was in the ashram for a long time with 80 people and they thought about it and they trained themselves and they educated themselves and it was only then that they walked and it was because they were ready that 10,000 people joined them on that march. Um, and so you, you need to do both. Um, but there needs to be some action now. I, I don't think we can wait until everybody agrees on the right path forward. I think people need to start walking down that road. I mean, I, I want to sort of follow up on her question a little bit more. Uh, because, you know, in, in, in what you said, you, you sort of appeal to the tenured professors and, and people who are sort of secure in their careers. But if you look at the audience here, most of them are starting their careers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the perspective is actually a much more dif you know, difficult one to negotiate. So how, what, do you sort of, what do you tell these students who want to get uh, papers out in good journals? And, and they have sort of preconceptions about what well, okay, so uh, one piece of advice is uh, I, I think the impact factors are somewhat overrated and I think by the time you are going for your tenure track positions, I think the world will have changed and so you can in fact begin publishing in the places that you think are the right places and partly that's something you do because you believe it's the right thing to do but I really do think that you know if you're looking 10 or 15 or 20 years down the pike the world's gonna have changed by then um, and I don't think it's the right thing to do to say well I like this open access journal but I might get some slight marginal benefit by being over at this other journal that the publisher is trying to get me to do it's not ha gonna have a huge impact on your career. Um, it's just a very marginal change. Um, and so I, I, I would say that if you can, um, obviously you don't, you know, if, the Ameri if you're a medical student and, and the Lancet wants your piece, then you, you probably do it there. Uh, but if you're debating between two slightly different journals, well, you know, pick the one that's more open. The world. There's a, a well-thought-out uh, document, at least for the first time, that has now come out. This is just in the recent issue of Kinsa. The, the world really is changing. There, there is no doubt about it. And open access is very much the wave of the future. Um, and, and that is going to happen. We, we have to fight to make it happen. But, but it's very clear at all levels and in all countries. Um, that people are beginning to move in that direction. Uh, part of the trick is to make sure we don't get half-baked versions of open access. People have to stand up and say, no, 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 this silly gold version is, is just not working. DRMing the piece is no good. I should have a right to post my own work, right? The, the idea that, that you're not allowed to post your own articles is nuts. Right? Absolutely ridiculous. Th that should be fair use. And that's going to take a few lawsuits in some countries to do that. But, you know, in the U.S., it's very clearly fair use. It's your own work. I'm sorry. Uh, and the idea that you can only print, you know, you can only post the preprint, but the version of record is somehow something that you'll never be able to get access to, I, 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 I think that's immoral. I, I think if you wrote a paper, you ought to be able to have it on your own website for non-commercial use. So, um, 
So one thing I forgot to mention in the introduction is uh, an article by uh, Karl Malamud is uh, posted on, on uh, the web platform called Confluence, uh, which mm -hmm. is associated with the, the journal dialogue that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, please go do take a look at it. And uh, the reason I mention it now also is uh, the, the deliberations of the INSA committee that Amitabh mentioned will try to post uh, as a, a follow-up to Ka, uh, the, the article by Karl Malamut so that we can also look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. okay. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, sir, like you told that some of the companies, they, the publishers, they are over-utilization, they are uh, over-utilizing their copyright uh, thing. So, is there any rules made by the government that uh, copyright, like piracy, we have rules, very strict rules against piracy. So, is there any rules by the government Well, so there are two, so the, the, the question is, you know, there, there's an article online and it doesn't really have a valid copyright, but, you know, what can you do about it? Um, so there's two issues going on here. One is whether there's an over-assertion of copyright, what you can do about it. And as I told you, when I found all these works of the U.S. government, I wasn't sure I was going to post those because I, I, I suspect I would have gotten a strong backlash. I got it from the American Bar Association. I found 552 articles in the ABA uh, journals that were by federal employees and I had prepared a resolution on the floor of the American Bar Association House of Delegates. I got special privileges of the floor to present it and I had a phone call with a whole bunch of, of the sections and they said no, 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 none of them are works of the government. They were all done on their spare time. And I said that's kind of inconceivable. 552 articles including the examples I gave in my talk, chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, you know, talking about enforcement priorities. So problem number one is the over assertion. Uh, problem number two is to access these you've agreed to terms of use, right? So before you can even get to the article you've signed a contract and often that contract says I agree that the copyright is valid. Now that's an invalid contract but in both instances if the publisher decides they're going to be a jerk then you got to fight it and then you need lawyers and you end up in court and that's where the law schools come in because they can help do these kinds of things. We need some test cases. Um, when I come back in August I'm actually speaking at three or four different law schools around India and my hope is to get some students working with me on some of these issues. Um, to the extent that it's unclear though then, then that really is a matter for the courts or a matter for the governments, right? Som sometimes you can do these things without litigation. Sometimes if there's a hearing in Parliament, that's enough to like settle the issue because people just don't want to deal with it. It's like when Facebook gets dragged in front of the UK and the US Congress. Um, that makes them make some unilateral changes. So maybe it's going to take something like that. So, yeah. so there is some proposal uh, asking the MH MHRD, the Ministry of Human Resources uh, Development of this country, to take the lead I believe that one of, I, I think, I, I think universal access to knowledge would be a dandy campaign plank for a politician and I am very much hoping that at some point in the U.S. and India some politician looks at that and says this is important. Um, not only universal access, but let, let's begin systematically scanning all our resources. Um, I sent a letter to President Obama uh, with my former boss, John Podesta, and the title was Yes We Scan. I actually had a web website, yeswescan.org. If we can put a man on the moon, why can't we launch the Library of Congress into cyberspace? And we suggested to the president that we spend a billion dollars a year for 10 years and just dramatically begin digitizing a lot of the resources in our federal government. Um, unfortunately, you know, this was, uh, gosh, 2009. Uh, we had wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Our economy was melting down. The Republicans were going after the president. We, I mean, there were just so many things on the stack. We were never able to get the attention. Uh, but I believe, you know, a, a huge effort for a public library of India is something that, that a government would just get amazing feedback from people. It would be very popular, and so it would be very nice if we can get, get our politicians to begin embracing these goals. Re regarding what? Yes. I, 
I personally think gene patents are a ridiculous idea. I, 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 it's not an invention. I'm sorry. It's something that exists. Right? I, I, I can see a drug that you know, does something to molecules and genes maybe getting a patent. And even then, I'm somewhat skeptical on a lot of the patents that have been granted. I come out of a field that has software patents and business patents. And many of those are just amazingly bad. I remember Amazon got a one-click checkout patent right, for you know, being able to check out with one click. They got a patent on that, and it was rolled back. Uh, my work on, on, uh, on radio programs on the internet, somebody got a patent on podcasting a few years later, and they actually pointed to my stuff as prior art. But, but genes, I, I don't think, should be patented. I'm sorry. Uh, it's yeah. Yeah, arguably that's different, and maybe that's an innovation, but I don't know. I, I get a bad feeling when I see that. I, you know, personally, I wouldn't do it. I guess I'm willing to entertain some of the arguments on, gee, there was some true innovation that happened to modify this gene. But, but when people try to sequence uh, uh, the, the, the genome of an animal and then take out patents on certain ones that they happen to find do things, I'm sorry, that's human knowledge. That, that's, not, that's not an innovation. That's not an invention. So I'm personally skeptical. By the way, I'm spending a lot of time looking at traditional knowledge, and particularly you know, things like the patents on turmeric and the patents on neem and, and things of that sort. So I, I, spent, I was out at TDU this morning talking to Darshan Shankar, the vice chancellor, and um, I, I am looking at the question of traditional knowledge and how to make it more broadly available, and to do so in a way that doesn't result in lots of bad patents in the US on traditional medicine and traditional techniques here in India, because that, that again, I think is totally ridiculous. Okay, so we probably have time for a couple of questions before we Okay, so two more questions then. There's a huge fight. Yeah, so the question is, you know, patents are 60 years to, you know, life plus 60 years. And, you know, if you talk to Hollywood, they would like it to be infinite. Uh, we just had sound recordings go from 72 to 144 years. So there is a huge divide in the copyright world between copyright maximalists that want copyright on everything. And they want it to be absolute. And people, like in my side of the world that believes copyright is there for a limited period, for a limited number of things. It's simply there as an incentive. Um, it isn't an absolute thing. I think the copyright terms are ridiculous. Uh, copyright used to be 14 years. That's more than enough to exploit the commercial value of your novel and make a lot of money. I'm willing to entertain the idea of maybe renewing it. You know, Hemingway, I'm, I'm all for Hemingway making money. That's great. But at some point, the purpose of copyright is that Hemingway was, re was rewarded for his efforts, and now the book is in the public domain. Copyright is there for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. That is its purpose, and we have lost sight of that purpose. So the terms are ridiculous. Getting them rolled back uh, is going to be a huge fight. The, copy, I mean, the copyright and royalty in principle are two different things. Royalty yeah. to authors is one thing. Mm -hmm. but the copyright of the publisher is a different thing. And one of the things we pointed out to people, by the way, when we were putting standards and things online, we put the law online has no copyright, but you can still do these big case books with annotations and commentary and sell them. The Bible has no copyright, but it sells millions of copies every year, right? Um, you can have copyright, and you can have public domain, and they can coexist, and you can make a lot of money without that copyright incentive. Uh, you just make a nicer book, a better book. And again, I'm fine with you know, Hemingway or Stephen King or whoever or Bollywood um, getting a limited period of time exclusive right to exploit the commercial value. But then at some point, this stuff has to go out there for the actual purpose. You got money in return for a bargain with the people of India. And that bargain was, I'll get money for a while, and then this will be available to you. That's why you got copyright. It was for the purpose of promoting knowledge. Okay, thank you very much, everybody.
Gracias.